Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the September 2024 meeting of the Advisory Panel on Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Systems. Uh, well, let us do as we normally do and go around and introduce ourselves like Hollywood Squares. I will go through my screen, starting with Dale Manning. Could you just give us a hello and your name and a couple lines? Good evening. I am Dale Manning, citizen of the Nulhegan Band of the Kosuk Abnaki Nation. Glad to be here. Great. Thank you. Tyler. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tyler Allen. I'm the Adolescent Services Director with the Family Services Division and DCF's uh, Commissioner Designated Appointee on the RDAP. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Uh, Julio. I'm Julio Thompson, Assistant Attorney General um, and from the Civil Rights Unit. Great. Derek? Good evening, everyone. Derek, Mio Devnik, he, him, pronouns. My role with the Vermont Department of Corrections is a Community and Restorative Justice Executive, and I'm Commissioner Demel's uh, representative to the Racial Sparrows Advisory Panel. Thanks. Great. Jen Furpo. We, who I, of course, caught in an interesting moment. Yeah, uh, <laughs> trying to find <laughs> my mute. It was awesome. Uh, Jen Furpo, <laughs> training coordinator at the Vermont Police Academy. <laughs> Great. Uh, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner from uh, Defender General's office. Great. Um. I'm going to skip over someone, but we'll come back to them in the next uh, segment. And that would be Kim McManus, who um, I will introduce in a moment. But Mary, uh, sorry, Judge Morrissey. Quite all right. I'm Mary Morrissey. I'm the uh, I, uh, Vermont Superior Court Judge, and I'm the Judiciary Representative on this panel. Thank you. Laura. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Carter, and I am a data analyst within the Division of Racial Justice Statistics in the Office of Racial Equity. Great. Thank you. Grant? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Grant Taylor, and I'm a citizen member of the RDAP. Yeah. Lauren Higby, please. Hi, everyone. Lauren Higby, she, her pronouns. I'm Deputy Advocate with the Office of the Child, Youth, and Family Advocate. Great, thank you. Representative Arsenault. Hello, uh, my name's Angela Arsenault. I'm a representative from Williston and I serve on the House Judiciary Committee. Great. Representative Lalonde. Good evening, uh, Martin Lalonde, representative from South Burlington and chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Happy to be here. Great, thank you. Susanna. Hello, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. My heart's in my stomach because I'm seeing at least three of you on the call who I owe a response to something. So, sorry. <laughs> that one. Uh, Marshall Paul. Hello, I'm Marshall Paul. I'm the Deputy Defender General and Chief Juvenile Defender, and I am here as a guest today. Thank you. Jeff Jones. Uh, Jeff Jones, uh, retired VSP, and uh, I guess governor of Puerto Rico. Thank you. Sheila. Good evening, everyone. Sheila Linton, she, her, her pronouns, um, panel member and executive director of the Root Social Justice Center. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Hi, everyone. Jessica Brown, <clears throat> she, her pronouns, community member appointee to the panel, still driving home. So I'll be off camera for the time being. Understood. Um, Reverend Hughes. Hey, Tan. Uh, what's going Hello. on? I am uh, Reverend Mark Hughes. I'm the executive director of Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. I'm commander of Post 782 Veterans of Foreign War here in Burlington. I'm also the co-chair 
of the Health Equity Advisory Commission. I go by he, him uh, pronouns. It's good to see you, and it's also good to see uh, some of our representatives on, particularly in judiciary. Great. Uh, and Matthew Bernstein. Thank you, Matthew Bernstein, child, uh, he, him pronouns, child, youth, and family advocate for the state of Vermont. I'm um, fussing with technology, so hopefully you can hear me and maybe you'll see me later. Um, uh, community member, thank you. Great. Um, the announcements now. Um, what, the first that I have is um, that Kim McManus who is the, let me see if I remember, Associate General Counsel for the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Did I get that right? Great. Is now joining us as a voting member, correct? Um, not that I know of. Uh okay. But you're just <laughs> saying, you're just I'm here. I'm the guest today, yes. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I got that wrong. I get a lot of things wrong these days. And for the second announcement, Susanna, can I ask you to introduce our new member who we already know? Yes, all. Um, our attendee list doesn't look tremendously different, but it is a little bit because one of our uh, attendees has a shiny glow around him because Grant Taylor has gone from being the RDAP's support person to being a member of the RDAP. He is a community appointee of the Office of Racial Equity. We are very grateful that he was willing to um, shift his role, his participation on this panel. He comes with a, a background in data, um, in policy with data, and with a deep passion for uh, approaching his work with an equity lens. So we're really grateful um, that he was willing to, to take that on. Thank you and welcome Grant in like, you know, another way. <laughs> so those are the two announcements that I have. Anyone else have any others? Okay, um, let us move on to the minutes, the August minutes. I am sorry once again that they didn't get out of my computer until 6 a.m. yesterday. Um, I literally had a bad weekend making samosas. So I was like really obsessed. Sheila. Um, I would like to move to approve the, what are we, my, eight August minutes, but um, while we're doing that, before that, I just want to make an announcement because <laughs> I didn't chime in quick enough. Again, just as a reminder, ARC, ARC, uh, ARC stands as a new branch of the root, which stands right. for Asylum Seeker Refugee Immigrant Community, is having a sports event in Brattleboro, the Brattleboro Union High School on September 28th from um, 1 to 5 p.m. Cycling, tug of war, soccer or football, depending on how, where you're from, um, and um, running as well. It's a family-friendly event. We hope you'll come. And um, just as importantly, The Root is having um, their 11th year anniversary party at The Root Social Justice Center on October 19th from 3.30 to 6.30. Again, family-friendly. We hope that there'll be food, music, and how we do, if you know how we do. So you can find information on our website and or on our social media. And I hope you all, um, those events are yeah. open to all. And I hope you'll come um, jam out with us and meet some of our communities. And maybe community members um, who are front lines, who are immigrants, who are refugees, who are BIPOC, who are asylum seekers. And it's really important as we talk about the work that we're doing here, that we don't just talk about the work, but that we've actually formed the relationships with the people who are impacted directly by the work that we're doing. So I'm hoping that if you're able to come down to Brattleboro and hang out with us. Absolutely. So moving the minutes. Oh, okay. I had one correction for the minutes and that is Daniel Bennett's name has two T's. I know that was major, wasn't it? But I second the motion with that addition. All in favor? Signify by some interesting way that we'll work on Zoom. This is how the deaf community does it. 
Okay. All those against. Okay. And those abstaining. This is Jessica Brown. I'm abstaining because I wasn't at the August meeting. Thanks. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> And the the minutes pass with that one little T. So thank you. Now moving on to the meat of the thing, um, we had begun what three months ago, a discussion concerning DCF and the proposed juvenile facility in Virgens, and we had a presentation that Tyler gave us with the deputy commissioner of DCF, whose name is not coming to me right now. But... Erica Radke. Thank you. That was <laughs> getting that wrong. Erica Radke. And so you'll remember that. This is the second part of that presentation. And this is coming from both Marshall Paul and Rebecca Turner from the ODG. Um, and I would like to turn it over to the two of you. Thanks, Eitan. Um, Yeah, you know, I'm going to be quick from my end. I'm just going to uh, introduce, although I think everyone here knows, but in case not, uh, Marshall Paul uh, uh, is here to um, share uh, and address questions on this subject. Uh, he is, of course, our Deputy Defender General and Juvenile uh, Defender. So, Marshall, I'll defer you. Thank you. And um, so, Rebecca's already introduced me and I've introduced myself. I won't bore everybody with that. Um, I did read through the minutes from the last meeting uh, and I'm not actually 100% certain exactly what uh, this group is is looking for. I'm happy to comment on the work that's been happening so far around the um, proposed secure facility uh, in Virgins. Um, that facility has been sort of a long time in the incoming. I think ever since Woodside closed, there's been sort of talks and promises of building a new secure facility. Um, and the proposal to site the facility in Virgins and the uh, sort of preliminary designs and plans that DCF developed were really the first, uh, I would say the first effort towards that, um, towards something that's actually a Woodside replacement. There had been a plan in the past to develop a secure treatment facility in Newberry. Um, that ended up not happening, and it would have served an entirely different set of needs anyway. Um, so I'm really, you know, I want to start by saying, please interrupt me with questions, because what I'm going to have to say about the Virgins facility and the planning around that is actually not much. It's, we're very early in the process. There's a legislatively composed working group that is looking at the process. And frankly, I think that group has only met a handful of times. And at this point, I would say that that group is really in the very beginning phases of even really sort of understanding what the process is going to be. Um, there's been concerns from our office that there seems to have been a lot of decisions made about the plan before the plan was actually developed. Um, so for example, TCF had identified a site, had, identi had designed, you know, engaged a, an architect to do preliminary building designs, had come up with a size for the facility, had come up with, um, you know, some details about how the facility would look and how it would operate. Um, but there seems to be some real missing pieces that haven't been filled in yet. So when we started in this process, I started asking questions about what's the expected length of stay? What's the identified treatment modality? What are the cri criteria for admission? What are the criteria for discharge? What is what does step downs look like? One of the problems that always happened at Woodside, I mean, a constant problem at Woodside is that we would have residents at Woodside 
who everybody agreed, you know, there would be no dispute that they were ready to step down from Woodside, but they often stayed at Woodside because there was nowhere to step down to. And so one of our concerns, our office's concerns going into this project was ensuring that we didn't go building, you know, high level secure beds without having develop the sort of lower level infrastructure so that people who are children who are placed in those um, highly secured beds actually have a place to go when they are ready to move out. Um, so we have a lot of concerns that there's been decision making that's happened, sort of that the decision making has got ahead of the process, but we're very glad that the process is happening. We're glad to be included in it. Um, and frankly, at this point, it's really too early to offer much comment about it. The working group has been divided up into a number of subcommittees. Um, our office is on all those subcommittees, but I'm not actually aware of a single subcommittee that's met yet. Um, so I think the the really, you know, the the takeaway from our perspective is there isn't actually much of a plan that's been developed yet. And to the extent that there is a plan, we're kind of cautious that that uh, that plan may not have been very well developed. Um, and I'm happy to take questions about the our role in the planning around the juvenile facility yeah. or anything else for that matter. Okay. Questions, people? I don't want to, I, of course, I don't like putting people on the spot, but I, I'm going to have to right now because... Sheila, you had a lot of really good points when we had the first discussion, and I'm wondering if this is an opportunity for any other questions that you have um, to be answered. That's all. Um, so I'm trying to absorb, well, thank you, Marshall. I appreciate that, and thank you, Aton. Um, I'm absorbing the information that I just heard and trying to make sure that I understand it correctly. Um, and what I think I just heard was that people were already in the making of making this facility when Woodside was going out. So there was already plans for this and that people didn't necessarily do all their due diligence in, in doing this and that there's gaps, um, such as not having a downstep or whatever you called it. Um, I'm, I, I don't, First of all, I'm just bothered by that. <laughs> I'm just going to express that right off the top. So let's come back to me maybe because I feel like I just need to process and I don't know what to ask. That was information that was, I mean, um, I don't know if there were questions that I asked in the last meeting that haven't been answered that maybe would be great. But I, I as of right now, I just need some time to process okay. that and see what it is. That okay. I, think. I just... Can I just climb, chime in because I probably was a little bit unclear. I didn't mean to imply that at the time of the closing of Woodside, they were there was already plans to build this particular Virgin's facility. Just that at the time that Woodside closed, um, from the moment it closed, there were people discussing replacing it um, with another secure facility, a Woodside-like facility um, in terms of its security level. Okay. And Marshall, what I'd like you to know, the reason that the RDAP is taking this up is partly because one of our members, and that would be Sheila, brought up a really good point that there, this is a place in which racial disparities can easily make an appearance. And therefore, we're trying to be a bit proactive and get a sense of what the agency, of what all of the agencies are doing, putting this together, partly because if we don't get in front of things, we don't get anything. Um, and we that's happened, it happened a lot last session. And so this is partly an attempt for us to get in front of the ball that's rolling. And I think that's a great point. The racial disparities at Woodside have historically been a um, historically been very dramatic. Um, it's been hard to get information about racial disparities within the juvenile justice system. Period. 
But interestingly, Woodside was one of the only places where we ever actually used to get good statistics, which mm -hmm. is really because Woodside's computer system, when it when it was in existence, was so antiquated that um, when people at Woodside, when the staff at Woodside were doing an intake, they couldn't move past the intake screen if they had not filled out the race field. Um, and that meant that it was literally the only place in the juvenile justice system where we had race data that was of any value whatsoever. I mean, there was supposed to be race uh, data collected by police at the point of arrest or citation, but that wasn't happening in more than 40% of cases. So that data was no good. There was no data being kept by the judiciary at the time. Um, and there was very little data being kept by DCF, except for this little window that we got, which was the Woodside admissions. and. If you go back to uh, pre-pandemic 2015-2016 um, numbers, the racial disparities were tremendous. Even though uh, Black youth make up only 2 or 3 percent of the Vermont population at that time, uh, they made up, they were 700 percent more likely to be placed in Woodside than their white peers. Um, this is OJJDP data. And so they use black and non-black as the two racial identifiers, um, which I think is problematic, but it was the data we had to work with. Um, and we've seen that as a historical pattern. I think at the time Woodside closed, <clears throat> excuse me, there was actually a really small number of residents at Woodside. And yet, I, if I remember right, there was four non-white residents and one white resident, and that's in an overwhelmingly white state. Um, and what we're looking at there is really the racial disparities that exist at the, at the highest level of the juvenile justice system. I mean, juvenile justice in Vermont doesn't get any more intense and involved and um, restrictive than it did at Woodside. I mean, that was sort of the, the most high needs, high level, high security environment that a youth could be placed in. Um, and it's where we saw real tremendous racial disparities. So it is absolutely something that our office is concerned about and that in this planning process, we are hoping to see plans that address that historical racial disparity um, you know, in a in a forward looking way. Okay. So that we're not repeating those problems as we open a new facility. Right. Right. Anyone else? Marshall, can I prompt a follow up on the on that point? Um so what we know is is that this is a, you know, what you're sharing about the beginning stages of of the planning for Virgins, but who exactly are the people in this group, and particularly with the perspective of having the concerns about addressing and not having repeated or inheriting those old racial um, inequalities from the Woodside process, how are they being checked or being consciously addressed in terms of this group and in terms of the next plans for the facility? That's honestly probably a question that's better addressed to Tyler. I'm uh, I'm not 100% familiar with the makeup of the group because it was sort of constituted by the legislature and I was not part of that process. But Tyler can probably answer it. He sort of chairs the Yeah, group. I chair that. Oh, hey, Tom, would you like me to answer? See your hands up. It's your meeting. Okay. I, I'm later. I it, Yeah, I'm sure. It, it can totally hold. In a nutshell, when we did start trying to try talk about how to chunk out this work, because it's hard to make progress on this conversation when it's so broad. And Marshall's right, we haven't been able to convene any of the subcommittees. I brought them up last month um, as things we wanted to. I do want to say as an update on that, um, I would like to, I will be assembling the first of those, which will be the project design where we're talking about the physical plant um, next week. Uh, we're going to introduce uh, the the vendor who's who's contracted to provide services. Um, 
we're going to be introducing them to the group. It's on this Monday to the larger group, and then the smaller subcommittee will start next week. Um, and Marshall, I wasn't sure if you wanted to be on that or assign it to somebody, but I would love you or one of your folks there. Uh, uh, so when we specifically were talking about the racial racial components to this, as we identified all those subcommittees, there was one that was about entry into the program, one is about program design, one's about oversight of the program and all that. We had a distinct conversation about the racial justice, the racial income, uh, comp, uh, the racial implications of a program like this. And I think to my memory, that conversation was about this needs to be woven through the work of each of those committees um, and kind of be part of all of it. You can't just have one separate committee that's talking about race. So I think there's probably a more specific question about um, what you know? What happened in Woodside with regard to racial disparity? Where does that sit with DCF decision making? Where does that sit with court decision making? So on and so forth. Um, I think that's all fair game for the conversations, and I think it needs to fit in any subcommittee or the larger group as well. And and there are, there are still many questions that need answers, and we are st I'm still looking for folks uh, to kind of come in and weigh in on. Um, how do we articulate those? How do we articulate some solutions in a forward thinking way? Okay. So that, that just to, just to reiterate, you're asking for some participation from the people here. I, I'm welcoming participation from folks. Got here. it. Okay. Okay. Miss said that. Sorry about that. Okay. Actually, can I ask you to send me the dates and stuff in an email and I'll then forward it back out to people? That's a great idea. I'd be happy to do that. Great. Thank you. I will say the next the next one that we have on the books is this coming Monday at four right. o'clock. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, my question had to do with uh, uh, to Marshall had to do with did was there a sense uh that somehow i guess i would now say it this way uh was there any relation between the disparities that you saw at woodside given that that's the one thing you had to go on from dcf and anything beyond that anything beyond woodside <laughs> Or was it literally just that focused? You could you make any sur surmises? Could you assume anything from that? Is did it go anywhere beyond where it went? So I can say that we tried hard to figure it out. Um, there was a lot of finger pointing. Um, you know, there was a lot of when we went to the judiciary. There was a lot of pushback saying. Well, we would start with DCF. We, we went to DCF and said, wow, this is a lot of racial disparity. And there was pushback saying, well, we're just dealing with what, you know, judges order. When judges order kids in custody, that's the population we're dealing with. Talk to the judiciary. Tried the judiciary. And the judiciary essentially said, we don't keep those records, but we're just dealing with what DCF's recommendations are. Um, and then there's the question of, well, is that are we really dealing with a disparity in arrests, or are we dealing in it with a disparity in how we process those cases? Are we dealing with disparities in um, which cases are going to diversion, which is versus which are taking a courtroom track? Are there disparities in what recommendations DCF is making once they're in the courtroom? Are there disparities in what decisions make or judges are making? when they're making decisions, um, all the way back to the point of, are there disparities in the arrests and citations? And we were never able to find data on any of those. Um, and I, frankly, my presumption is that what there is, is racism at every level, level that stacked up to pretty extreme disparity at the sort of highest point. Um, but that's just a presumption because we never had that data. Okay. Okay. Because that's something that we have the, that was something that was behind the creation of the Division of Racial Justice Statistics. 
was to begin to try to get that um I wouldn't say more centralized, but I would certainly say to at least to a point of being able to talk to each other because as we were assembling, we were looking to find what data existed out there. And I think I think it was Rebecca and I had a joke that after we had found it, we should put it in a time capsule up on top of Camel's Hump because it took forever to get it. And I'm not sure what it entirely showed us. <laughs> Um, except that there were all these holes in, in data and the, a lot of systems that don't talk to each other. So it made it difficult. Um, interesting that we're back to that. Um, I find at least. Okay. Thank you. I was just, I was curious if that was, if the Woodside data was indicative of anything further, if you found it. So other questions from people. Julio. Who's the vendor for the services? That that's not I know the the vendor for building the site is Rearch. That's on the website. Yeah. But yeah. there's no mention of who the third party provider is. Oh, apologize. Yeah, that was put out in the um uh in uh a raise the age legislative report that went out last month. Um but the, the vendor's name is Sentinel LLC. They are a program that is newly developed and they're, uh, they're where they came from. It's the senior administration from uh, the Beckett family of services. Beckett family services is respond. They have several programs out of state tr treatment programs out of state. Um, they also house the largest residential treatment program within state. That's um, Vermont school for girls. Um, it's a 15 bed program down in Bennington. Uh, they also are responsible for uh, support and stabilization, which is a DCF um, uh, program that uh, does in-home family service services. It's kind of akin to wraparound services provided by the DA. Um, and the idea behind that is you provide stabilizing services into home-like environments. Um, to prevent the necessity of stepping into a residential system of care or to facilitate the movement out of a residential system of care into a home system of care. Um, so we have a lot of experience with them as a treatment provider. They were the program we were working with uh, with regard to Newberry. Um, Marshall mentioned that earlier. That, so the, the, the treatment programs we're looking, looking to build are similar in nature although the footprint of the youth campus described um, is different than the one in Newberry. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, let me, uh, um, I would be very, it seems to me <laughs> that the most important thing at this point because it's at a building stage, is that the answers to the questions that the RDAP might have are going to be found in the meetings of the subcommittee and such, that that's where things are going to be asked and answered um, uh, and not answered fully. Yeah. And I think. Go ahead. I'll just say, I think this is the process of figuring it out. We just had our first meeting where we introduced that program I just talked about to REARC, who is the design firm that kind of came up with the initial conceptual design. And the program had lots of suggestions how they would see things differently, including uh, adding on vocational, uh, vocational space to the educational part of the building, including expanding dramatically the recreation yard and so on and so forth. So I think there is a lot of opportunity for shifting things around, but uh, we, need to, we need to do that part quickly um, so that, and we also simultaneously need to start advancing the other, but we need to start getting feedback into that population, which is why I want to assemble that group next week. All right after they meet the meet the operator. Okay. So what I want to put out here to us, to the RDAP, is and particularly to the community members, it would really be helpful um, if someone from um, this group would sit on that subcommittee. 
Um, oh, there's a hand. A uh, hand, not a volunteer hand. Got it. <laughs> okay. And, and just before we continue that question, I, the question I still have for Tyler, I don't, I'm sorry if I missed your, in your answer, Tyler, who exactly, I don't know who is the list of members on this, in this group, and if there are any ones on there that are not government. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, sorry, I should have that put together and put on the web page. That's my fault. I don't have that up. I just haven't assembled it. I invited all the people. Um, I'll, you'll have to give me a moment to find them. There are several non-government members on the group. We have somebody who has a historical lived experience from a treatment program he was in in New York um, that was harmful for him. We have um, our youth, youth advisory board representatives on the group. Uh, there are, there are non-government members there, but I will say the majority of the people on the group and the people that attend the most regularly are government uh, representatives. I know we have some uh, two representatives that are from the Council for Equitable Youth Justice. Um, uh, I, I'll have to pull together the list, but I can get that to this whole group as well. Great. Um, what I was, I was sort of going in that direction, and that was why I was particularly addressing this to the community members. Uh, it would be good for somebody to be on that. I am very reluctantly saying that I would do that, except I'm doing everything else. I'm just putting that out there like that. Sorry, I don't mean to sound like I'm God, but I'm doing everything else. And I would really appreciate it if somebody else would step up to monitor that because I really have a lot of, I don't have a lot of time left in my life right now. Sheila. Hey, Tom, oh, Tyler. One I minute, just would, off, okay. Well, I just offer up for context. There are a couple of people that are on the R depth depth that are also in that group. Right. Um, uh, or people that are at least present here that are on that group. Uh, Susanna is a member of the group. Um, 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 um. Marshall, I know you are. Lauren is always there. Uh, and Matt, uh, Although I don't think you're RDAP members, you're both in both groups all the time. Um, so there is representation. There are people in this room that are in that space too. Right, but I was I, I really meant it about the community members for a p very particular reason. Sheila. So um, this subcommittee, how often does it meet, or is it just beginning to figure out how often it will meet? Subcommittee is just getting started. I'd expect up front we'll be meeting more often than once a month, but I would anticipate that would turn into a once a month cadence. I think most of the subcommittees, I imagine once a month cadence, but I think some starting needs to, to get, you know, go to get a good head of steam. I would like to see, you know, every two weeks or something for a, for a few iterations before taking more space. For a couple of hours virtually? They tend to be, I usually schedule them for one hour that's most productive, uh, and they'll all be virtual. And starting on Monday at four, you said? Monday at four, it's one hour. That's the larger group. That's the facility planning stakeholders work group. That is the set group we've been talking about, but it's a public meeting, so anybody's welcome to attend. What I'm talking about also is participation on the subcommittees. Um, and we went through them last time, like what the different subcommittees kind of can do. But like, that's where I think we can have some really nuanced conversations where it's just like, let's figure stuff out. Let's just figure this out and get some grist there to bring to the larger group to to, to also, you know, look at. Um, my life is very um, complex and complicated, but I could see if I could fit um, something in depending on when when that happens. I'm not free on the second Tuesday from six to eight. <laughs> <laughs> and why, why know. ever not? <laughs> so um, if, if I could have just, if you could send us those who might be interested in more information um, of, you know, yeah, times, expectations, all that stuff, that, that would be really helpful in me to see if I can um, have some space in my calendar to um, join. Bless you, Sheila. Mm -hmm. And Tyler, can you also send that information to Daniel Bennett? 
I would love to. Sheila right. and Daniel. Thank you. We have a question in the chat. Can we also learn a bit about the interim red clover program to operate in Middlesex? Will that run until the Virgens project is operating? That's that's a great question. Um, so yes, so the interim red clover program is a very small uh, four bed capacity program. It is in the former uh, Middlesex Therapeutic Residential Community Building. It, this was a DMH building that housed adults. Um, it has since had some renovation done to it to make it a little bit more structurally hardened. Uh, the last time DCF utilized this for a youthful population, it was um, harmful to it was it was harmful. There's some kids eloped from the program. There's always risk associated with that. Um, the building was simply not did not have the capacity to hold them. So we did some hardening. Uh, we also didn't we had a much different, you know, that was then staffed with former wood saps, Woodside staff. It was a different whole different universe, but that's the same structure. The building is nearing end of life. Uh, BGS would have said it is past its expected uh, life. Um, but we were able to kind of reinforce it and stabilize it because it was something that we knew and we had access to immediately. And so it is supposed to only get us up to such a time until we have a permanent solution, which is permanently penned in as the, um, the Green Mountain Youth Campus in Virgins. Uh, that program is going to be operated by Sentinel. That's actually their contract is to step in and work that program. Um, and part of the idea behind this program is figuring out how to work with them, how to work instead of having, as, as, as I've understood it, and we've thought about it, a detention center sort of universe, have it as a secure treatment program, work out some of the kinks to those process um, and understand how to advance it and make it work better on a small scale before we can operate the larger facility. There is no intention to have both of them uh, open concurrently. Uh, I think it, by the time we have a new facility, we'll be long since ready to retire that building. Okay. I have one if nobody else does. Okay, Eitan. Um, Sentinel. Do we know anything about their uh, track record around issues of equity, that sort of thing? I haven't had any challenges working. Sentinel is a new LLC, so they're a new program. They have a new program director that hired specific to this. Um, we have worked with them to great success with many youth going through DCF system of care. Again, the levels of care are different. These are treatment providers. Um, uh, this is a treatment program too, but they're not, uh, they haven't ever op operated a secure facility. Um, so I have no knowledge of anything harmful in terms of uh, uh, how those programs have been used or, or, or challenges with it. I know that they, of all of the residential programs we've worked with over these past years since the pandemic hit, have had, had the strongest track record of maintaining a stable staffing environment. Uh, they take some of our most challenging um, youth with challenging presentations, and we've enjoyed uh, a lot of successes from the youth stepping out of those programs. And I think there is a really nice streamlined element to them also being experts in the field of in-home services, uh, specifically to the point Marshall brought up earlier, which I couldn't agree more with, which is this is about stepping out of secure or even any form of residential placement. I think kids being raised in areas that are outside of homes has uh, unintended harm beyond what we can, you know, what we will, what, what we intend to, like keeping them too long in programs is harmful. And so that's specifically what we're looking for is how do we step them back into communities and homes as quickly as possible. And so there's a lot of pluses to working with them. Uh, they did come and respond to the, an RFP uh, actually after the fact that we released nationally to try to find a provider. That RFP was unsuccessful and they came back after the fact and said, actually, we think we can meet your need and here's how. And they had, um, you know, they had they had a good proposal attached to that. So 
we were able to turn that into a contract. Okay, great. Thank you. Lauren Higby. Thanks. Um, I, I just feel the, the need to clarify that Woodside was also licensed to provide treatment as a residential treatment program, albeit locked. And so I, I just caution that treatment can be just a word. And it, it seems like it potentially is, is just a word when we lock kids in, in any facility, really, since the research shows us that it does not lead to the outcomes that we are seeking. It does not rehabilitate children and adolescents and actually does the opposite. Okay. Thank you. Sheila. Um, I'm just really curious because, and I know I keep on re-explaining because I want to make sure that I'm processing things <laughs> and, and, and the way that people are saying them. Sentinel is the, is the company, correct, Tyler? That's correct. And That's correct. You, did I hear you earlier say that it's, I'm just going to use display in terms like repackaged because you said Sentinel, but then you went back, went back, went back, went back. And those are the same people who do all the other stuff. So even though this is a new program, it's run by the same old Gs, right? It's run by folks who run other residential treatment programs different than this one. Right. So it's a new yes. program run by the same real, it's run really by the same people, but it's a new program. Yeah, the, the administration is put together and their senior leadership team who's organizing the implementation effort are people that we've worked with longer, even though it's a new program. Yes. And then I'm just kind of curious because this got brought up in Brattleboro when we had our forum with all of you about, so are these people, do they, who makes money? I, I'm really curious around the money. Who makes money off of these facilities? Who's Who are we paying? Who, who, who makes money? Because this isn't a nonprofit, right? So like it is a nonprofit. So who's who is somebody making money? Who are the who are the people who make money off of this facility? Everybody makes money off of things. Who are we paying to make money? So we're paying designers paying. Do you know a list of the people that we who make money in the creation of this and then we'll be making money actually off of this facility if that is a exists. I'm just curious. And I'm saying that because transparently in Brattleboro, when we had our forum, we had learned of an individual, I believe it was a sheriff in our community. And I believe he was um, a resource officer in our school who we um, did a campaign to remove resource officers from our school. And then we found out that he was a player in um, one of the locked facilities. And correct me if I'm wrong, Tyler, um, uh, a player in a financial way, in my understanding. And I just think the connections need to be more transparent of where this money's going. And I have no shame in calling names out um, because I think we should be being transparent about money because money is what um, sometimes drives some of our values and unfortunately puts us in, in situations like the situations we're talking about. So Tyler, do you know like who who are the players who make money off of this? I can answer to the question to the extent of the Beckett's family of services, they oh. operate nonprofit residential treatment programs. So that money is turned into the business some way or another. Of course, it's the livelihood for all the staff that are there and all the way up through. Um, but the, the, those are nonprofit First LLCs. Time you Pardon? S sorry. Oh, that's okay, Mark. Um, so there's that uh, with regard to um, the sheriff down in Brattleboro. Uh, the the rest stop was the program we were talking about before. It is not a secure uh, treatment program. In fact, it's not a treatment program at all. I think we talked about this before. The rest stop is an alternative placement that DCF can access in order to temporarily house an individual that we cannot find any other placement for. Um, it's an emergency-based uh, uh, system of work that we wish we could get as far away from as possible because it's not a treatment program and it doesn't uh, account for all the needs of a youth. It's simply a space that we can utilize. Um, 
There is also the development of another uh, two bedroom program in that same building. It would be about leasing space for the building. And that we also would have a simultaneous RFP going out um, to find a provider. Again, this would not be a secure placement. It has unlocked doors. And the intention behind that two bed program is to expand our capacity for step downs and to uh, deal with you know, imminent crisis. That would be a crisis stabilization program and as well in a non-secure way. So it could be a step down from a secure setting or otherwise, um, or it could be a step down from a hospital setting. There are hospital settings that are locked as well. Um, so it, it could be any number of things. It's to create a little space for DCF to be able to work with the family to find an appropriate treatment services for youth in our care. Marshall, you had had your hand up and then you put it down. Would you like to put it back up? Thank you, Tyler. No. Okay. Um, any other questions? We could sort of wrap this part up given where we're at in the evening. Marshall, I want to say to you, thank you for coming. And as I think you certainly understand, conversations grow at their own speeds. And I think we probably had you in a little bit early, but um, I'm hoping that if we need to have you back, you'll not take this, <laughs> take this amiss. <laughs> No, no, it's, uh, I'm happy to come back anytime. Um, okay. I'm always happy to come back and talk about this. Great, great. Um, and so before we close this out, any other final questions here? Okay, great. Thanks, Matthew. I mean, Marshall. God, I don't know what I'm doing tonight. Anyway, all right. The next item on the agenda, and you'll recall I sent this out earlier, um, a lot earlier, um, is a continuation of this, uh, no, sorry, feedback on the Vermont Criminal Justice Council Code of Conduct. Um, you've read it. Um, I put down on the agenda Tiffany North Reed because I was talking with Tiffany, but she's not here this evening. I'm wondering, Lauren, is that going to be you, Laura? No, I didn't attend. I wasn't at that meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, well, uh, let's at least put the feedback that you may have on the minutes. So they're there. That seems important to me. Um, Open the floor for commentary now that you've read it. You can even say you liked it. I liked it. <laughs> I'll put that out there. I had nothing that I really wanted to add to that. I thought it was very uh, capacious. It covered a great deal of things. Um, I felt fairly comfortable with it. Now, having said that, I'm sure there's something I'm missing that hadn't even occurred to me. That seems to always happen to me in this job. Um, but so far, it looked really good to me. I'm just putting that out there so it gets in the minutes. Anything anybody else wants to put out? Ah, and Kim McManus is available for any questions about the code or how it fits within the VCJC unprofessional conduct statutes. Gosh, Kim, I'd just like to hear you talk about that. Well, I don't know if everyone uh, feels the same uh, when a meeting is in the evening time, but I am happy uh, to give an overview if that's helpful. I don't know what Tiffany shared uh, with you all previously, so I don't want to be repetitive. Uh, I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kim McManus. Uh, as Aton said earlier, I am the Associate General Counsel with the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Uh, Tiffany uh, Northreed from the Office of Racial Equity 
uh, has joined uh, a committee called the Act 56 Review Committee, uh, which has been working on changes to uh, one of the categories of our unprofessional conduct uh, statutes. As some of you might know, um, for law enforcement officers in the state, uh, there are three different buckets that an unprofessional conduct complaint could fall into. Category A is criminal offenses. C category B are policy violations statewide or their local law enforcement policies. And category C are uh, sort of council related policies. Um, category B has always, I shouldn't say always, but category B has been um, a little hard for everyone to wrap their hands on over the last few years. And so uh, the council and the legislature has been working uh, the last few years on uh, looking at category B, the definition. Uh, one of two of the big issues were that category B conduct uh, did not include off-duty behavior. Um, it also, uh, the council is quite limited on the first offense of a category B conduct. Uh, and the professional regulation subcommittee of the council was seeing a number of cases where we were seeing unprofessional conduct that we felt should be actionable and the way the statutes are currently, currently written, uh, we were unable to take action on those. That's a big general background and I'm happy to dive into some deeper areas, but essentially this question was raised, uh, can we improve category B? Uh, and, and what does the council want to do with it? Uh, the council formed a subcommittee called the Act 56 Review Subcommittee. Uh, we met last fall uh, and submitted a report to the legislature, uh, essentially uh, saying um, no other state uh, ties the type of behavior that we've listed in the, what you saw as the code of conduct, no other state uh, ties that to local law enforcement policies. Uh, and because that was tied to local law enforcement policies, we found a lot of inconsistencies. If an agency didn't have a policy about that particular behavior, uh, the agency would have to call it a policy violation and not have the complaint go through. Um, so our group essentially said, you know what, this is our opportunity to simplify uh, category B conduct. Let's take all the behavior that we know we do not want to see within the profession uh, and move it away from individual policies and create a code of conduct. So while the group last fall was working on how we wanted to change um, the definition, we wanted to give an example of what that change would look like. So as we decided we wanted to ask for uh, this code of conduct, we started drafting a code of conduct as by way of example. The legislature uh, took our suggestion uh, and P Act 124 was passed this past June, uh, giving us the responsibility of creating this code of conduct uh, and putting it in place by the end of the year uh, with rules, council rules around it. Uh, so the draft that was shared with you, uh, Tiffany, so excuse me, circling back, T Tiffany North Reed joined our committee this fall uh, as another set of eyes to look at the code of conduct um, from a non-law enforcement uh, perspective. Uh, we've pushed this out to all of our law enforcement stakeholders, and we are trying to circulate it amongst our non-law enforcement stakeholders. Uh, to, as Eitan said, see what we're missing. Uh, did we miss anything? Uh, we we feel we did a pretty good job uh, capturing, again, the behaviors that we were seeing um, that we don't want to see in our profession, um, but we were very happy to have other eyes on it. Um, so again, happy to talk more about how we got to this point uh, or anything else about the legislation that wraps around this. Um, if anyone has any particular questions. Let me get to the root here for a moment. Um, did everyone look at it? Okay. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure that the silence wasn't that nobody had done the homework. <laughs> uh, that's all. 
I'll also put out there, uh, if anyone uh, you know doesn't feel like answering on the spot, uh, we are taking, the subcommittee is taking feedback until September 20th, next Friday. Uh, we do have a link to submit feedback if you'd prefer to do it in writing uh, and not do it here in the meeting. Uh, and I can uh, email Tiffany and just ask her to circulate that uh, to everyone in the group if that's if that's better for you or just a second option. I think we can do that. Does anyone have a problem with that particularly? I guess not. I think that's a good idea. But I'll, oh. make, I'll make some comments though. Um, Go for it. You know, I didn't really, I didn't have a really lot to say other than from what I grasped from the materials that were sent to us, one of the biggest changes, as you mentioned, was to take it out of the policy pace, to take it out of the individual um, entities and make this a statewide policy. And currently it's not statewide. So that keeps on getting all these hiccups with individual entities, I guess, across the state is, is one of the main things I heard. And I just, I was just, I was just kind of curious of how that happened or why, and I don't necessarily need that answered. It was just, it was interesting for me. Um, I, I'm wondering just some questions I have when I was reading the materials is 60 days. Um, it mentioned something about 60 days where if something happened, um, at least 60 days, um, they wait. And I'm just wondering around, there's these timelines, 60 days, 90 days. And I'm just wondering what those days, if they're tied to some type of legislation, some type of other policy, who, who gets to determine that, you know, I noticed like, um, the executive um, gets to determine um, something and it's like 60 days, but what if the executive is like, no bueno, like, like I just, I'm trying to wrap myself around like what gives, I mean, maybe I guess it's their role that gives them that power and that discretion to allow a different timeline when somebody hasn't adhered to what they need to on the annual basis. So that's what I'm referring to. I'm sort of curious about that 60s days. And then I was also, what also interested me when I was reading it is, um, and I know this might sound ignorant to a lot of people, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, it, it, there was a quote in there that said, um, protect against illegal acts. And that was really interesting to me because looking at the police as a protection of things that are illegal not just to protect and safety, the safety. Like even if something isn't illegal, it could be unsafe or whatever. So it just, it made me think, the language made me think, is is that why we get tripped up in law enforcement a lot when we, some people call them and things happen is because they're enforcing what is only legal and not what necessarily the full needs are of our community. And I, I think that's a valid, I think that's a true point, but I, I, it just reading that language in there was like, huh, that just made me think of it in a different way. And then how do these things relate to the, oh, I was just really curious too of how these things relate to the union. And I don't know if that's an ignorant question, but like, um, I'm presuming they're a union. <laughs> they're like the biggest union in the country, right? Like they're the cops. And so like, I'm wondering, yeah, how does this relate to their union and all the things that, that are going into this? And then the last, like, just thing I thought about was who's on the council? It keeps on referring back to this council. It's like, what was on that damn council? Like, I'm just like really curious about that. Um, um, yeah, those are just thoughts that came up when reading all the documentation. Uh, can we take something from Jen Furpo? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to help out a little bit with the um, the union question. Uh, there is not one union that is for all law enforcement. Um, there's a whole slew of them, like uh, Burlington Police Department has their own union. The state police has their own union. Um, some folks become part of uh, some departments become part of larger national unions so it's not like there's just one police union in in vermont um, and as far as the council makeup that's made up of a, a bunch of folks and 
If you give me a second, I will try to put a link in the chat that links you to, that will show you exactly who's on the council. Um, the meetings are, as always, open forum. So if anybody wants to, to attend one of the meetings, they're virtual, you know, come on down, check us out, ask questions, poke <laughs> them with sharp sticks. I mean, that's what they're there for. Thank you. You're, thank you. Thank you. And thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. So looking at the, the statute, there is one of the prohibitions is a pro, you know, prohibitions against discrimination or bias. When I'm looking at the draft version, the by the discrimination paragraph, which is quite it's maybe it's the lengthiest paragraph. The discrimination that's uh, the type of discrimination is seems to be, at least as I'm reading it, and I know it's got several clauses, and I know how things that are put together by committees sometimes come out. Um, it talks, most of it is talking about discrimination on the basis of status, um, as a, but doesn't address other types of discrimination, like viewpoint discrimination, for example. So if people, yeah. you know, in some, some parts of the country, police have a long history of being uh, 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 a challenge to labor organizers, for example, uh, or people who might be protesting. So it, is there a component there that focuses not just on protected status, who you are, uh, but also protected activities like recording police, you know, the First Amendment kind of activity, other types of protected activities for which um, people have a constitutional right? Is that in there somewhere? That is a Good. Uh, sorry, Eitan, is that okay if I respond? Please. Yes, I'm sorry. Right. Yes, of and course. And then, Sheila, I have your things listed as well to to respond to. Um, Julio, that is a good question uh, for me to bring back, because I know we have the catch-all of any other protected characteristic under law, and I'm not sure if that um, umbrella term would fit what you're bringing up. So that's something I would have to to think more on and talk to you yeah. a little bit more about. It, it's front of mind. I mean, recently, you know, the the it, in in Washington D.C., the U.S. DOJ puts out reports on police departments they've looked at, and the, one of the more recent reports was about Phoenix, Arizona, where there was probably thirty five pages written about officers who would, who make lawful arrests, so they have probable cause to arrest somebody. But they identified or did they asserted that there was a pattern in practice in connection with police related protests in the summer of 2020 that officers were exercising that discretion based on the viewpoints of the protesters. So people who were pro police protesters were treated one way, people who were anti uh, police or maybe or, or wanted some police reform, you know, somewhere along that uh, along that spectrum were treated. Both ways, so it wouldn't be an illegal arrest in terms of not having probable cause, right? Um, uh, so I just didn't know where that that fit in because um, it is an issue of discrimination that comes up. Is um, or or in general, I don't looking here. I don't know that there is a code of conduct that just says that officers shall engage and shall respect the constitutional rights of all people they come in contact with. Um, whether that's a crime or not, or whether that's discriminatory or not, that just that they're going to engage in constitutional policing. I think, um, um, you know, I've seen that in other, in other types of codes of conduct that aren't statewide. So that was something I'm just interested in, and maybe it's a point for other people to think about a little bit more. And then the la the question I had was about the, um, the la and I'm just wondering how the the in this draft they landed, um, in that it, it won't be a course of conduct that's discriminatory, or a single egregious act that evidences discriminatory conduct. So if it's discriminatory, but not egregious, 
it, it exhibits bias, but it's a single non-egregious act that doesn't violate, I, it might violate the fair and impartial policing policy. Maybe that's the reasoning behind it, but I just, I wonder how you landed on or how folks landed on the egregious standard versus um, just not engaging in discriminatory and biased conduct. I think the the language that first sentence was trying to capture all the different possible ways, right? Course of conduct or one horrible incident. Um, and then there's the, or exhibits bias against individuals. So mm -hmm. okay. in, in artfully, like I think that we we're trying to capture, I have to, I will say to this group, and this is wonderful feedback, number two was, one of the harder ones for us to write and and none of us love it it's like wordy and unwieldy and and we were like what are we missing from it but we can't put anything more in it um so any feedback on on number two is appreciated as we as we tinker with it so julio i'll i can bring that back to the group mostly just to ask that question and to think through are we making it we're did we didn't, accidentally yeah. make it too complicated? I just you didn't know, know what it did. capture everything. I didn't know what it added that what single egregious act of discriminate that evidences discriminatory conduct, what act that would be that wouldn't also exhibit bias is mm -hmm. what you're saying. And I just didn't I feel like it's you know, sort of walking in after all the discussion is, is over. So I just didn't know what the story behind that that construction was because um, no, and it, as you can yeah. imagine, um, we were very much the the group was pulling from various other mm -hmm. codes and like we like mm -hmm. this part, we like that part. So there is a bit of a Frankenstein element of uh, okay. <laughs> piecing it together, um, but I, I do think we can simplify that number two, but. Mm -hmm without losing it, but we haven't gotten there yet. So this is good feedback. Okay, that was it. That was it. Thank you, Ekdan. Thank you, uh, Kim. It's good seeing you again, by the way. Good to see you. And then Eitan, if we have a minute, I'd be happy to- You want to address Sheila's... with Sheila, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I'm gonna work my way backwards, I think, on, on the list. Um, regarding the union, question. Uh, Jen Furpo mentioned there there isn't one statewide union, but a really important thing for folks to understand that gets confusing here is um, if an officer uh, does something, um, and currently we'll use the current law, and it's a policy violation uh, at their police department, whatever police department it is, the police department, as the employer, is going to have a discipline uh, matrix that they follow. And that's their employment piece. The Vermont Criminal Justice Council, we are the certifying body. We certify law enforcement officers. We essentially give them their license to be a law enforcement officer. And then we can take that license away, depending on whether or not they've met the definition of unprofessional conduct and whether the behavior uh, would meet that sanction. And there's other sanctions below that. Um, but essentially there's two processes that are going on. So anything that would have to do with the unions would be the employer, employee, and the and if there's a union involved, um, would take place over here. And then the certification question comes to us. There's a tiny bit of overlap depending on where they are in the union process when we get involved, but we're not directly involved with the union and and this code of conduct wouldn't um the union might bring it up in some other union matter but it wouldn't the union wouldn't get involved in in our um uh in a unprofessional conduct complaint or a uh finding that someone has violated the code does that answer your your question on unions okay um Jumping around a tiny bit, I think the and correct me if I'm wrong, the 60 days that you mentioned, did 
I don't know what Tiffany shared, but did she share the the uh, rules that we're working on around the code of conduct? Were there two documents that went out? No, one. Okay, so is the sixty days, Sheila, something that you saw in our statute? No, that we got two documents. Um, okay. I <laughs> yes, you did. I'm sorry, Sheila. I'm just going <laughs> to shut up and sit here. Yes, you're right. Um, and okay. yes, it's not Kim. Okay, so Sheila did the deep read. Excellent. So yes, yeah, so we're 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 editing the code of conduct, and we're also creating the council rules around it. And the legislature um, uh, told us to create rules around what the content of the code is, how to implement the code, and then how the code can be modified in the future. Because this is going to live and breathe with the council. And so, you know, once we decide this is the code of conduct and we put it out there to law enforcement, how can it change in the future? Um, and so the 60 days that you mentioned, uh, we wanted to create rules that this code can change in the future. Um, expectations uh, will change and vary uh, as our society changes. And we want to make sure that this is a living document, but we don't want it to um, change every two or three months, right? Like we're, we're saying to officers, like, here's the code. We expect you to follow the code and, and here are the repercussions if you don't. And so we wanted a very... Uh, thoughtful, deliberate process. If some, if if a, if the council decides to put forward a motion to modify this code of conduct, and so that sixty days in there, uh, we we sort of modeled it off of um, when a town passes an ordinance that you know essentially there's notice of the change, and then there's time for folks to process that, give feedback, have the council have time to process that feedback and then come back. And essentially it created a two vote um, a system uh, for any modification. So that 60 days, uh, that clock um, or calendar would be controlled by the council on when that motion is first brought up, if it's voted on, and then the 60 days would begin there for, for everyone to get their ducks in a row, um, give feedback, and then come back for another vote. Um, so, so the agency heads would not be involved in that. that that's council related, those changes. Um, but sort of to what your question, um, I think about agency heads and like, if that 60 days had something to do with reporting into the council, Agency heads do have, per our statute, rules about when they have to report complaints. And if we are given information that an agency head is not following that process, that is would fall under what we call a Category C violation. So an agency head not following council policies, and that's a whole unprofessional conduct uh, potential violation on its own. Uh, and then the, sorry, the last one was the illegal acts. And I, I, while I'm sitting here, I can't find where you 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 found. I can't find the line that that mentions illegal acts. So I'm I'm pausing to to respond to it. Do you happen to have it in front of you? You muted, Sheila. My bad. I could find it, um, but no, I don't have. Um, I could I could ultimately find it, but no, I don't have it right right in front of me. And I'm happy to follow up offline as well. Um, I just at the top of my head, I can't figure out where where it is. So, oh, Julio, though, it's going to help me out. I think it might be in the bill. <laughs> it's in the statute. Yeah, oh. the, statu the statute refers to protecting people against illegal acts. Oh, as manner. far as what needs to be in the content of the code, is that? Yeah. Okay. It says that it it effectuates the principle that law enforcement officers serve the communities of Vermont, that's A, and then B, protect all persons against illegal acts in a manner consistent with the high degree of responsibility and respect for human dignity required by the profession. Gotcha. Um, Thank you, Julia. Yeah. Julio, always, always helping. 
Um, so Sheila, that that was the yeah. The, I wouldn't want to speak for the legislature of why they worded it exactly that way. Um, and I don't know if I don't think anyone is on right now who could. But um, but I'm happy to chat more about this offline with you if if you would like. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's a chatting situation. I just feel uncomfortable with the statements. <laughs> <laughs> and and that you know trying to understand you know there is a perception or a reality that that is what the police are here to do is to protect things or whatever from illegal acts but is it more than that and if it is is that language incorrect um and i don't i don't really know i don't know from tv to experiences to whatever i'm not really sure i'm a little bit confused right now of what the the police are supposed to do to be honest from my own personal experience i wanted to ask and this is this is why we have a panel i feel like everybody's kind of a external hard drive to my brain and like we're all external hard drives to everybody else's brain because it brings up all the stuff that you'd sort of been thinking about. Egregious. Um, does that mean we're now going to have to set up a new precedent for what that means in the same way that one had to be set up for reasonable and suspicious and all that sort of stuff? So does that basically that mean that we have there's now got to be a new precedent created can to cover I, that can i comment on that aton that of course uh is that aligning i i i presume that's aligning with the um human rights commission on harassment and sort of bullying laws is very similar and under protected categories is when um it says the same thing in harassment with protected category it's like egregious thing and um defining that people have defined that in their own investigation but i'm wondering if that is mirroring the vermont human rights commission and what is happening there if that's where that was coming from far better ass than i said and i know a hand is up but just to respond from the the committee's work sheila yeah yes uh again we were pulling language from different uh, discrimination clauses. So from employment law, uh, we did look at the Human Rights Commission's language. Um, so that, that term egregious is used in other areas. And we would, you know, be making that if it would be me presenting to the council, like why in that instance, we'd be meeting that that definition. Okay. I, I, I mean, I know it's in other, but just because it's there doesn't mean it exists in this category, in this context. Mm -hmm. And I could point out a many places in which reasonable got defined in all sorts of interesting ways um, that didn't really agree with each other. So it, it just seemed, I was just concerned about that, where yep. that was yep. coming from. And this is great feedback again for me to bring back to the subcommittee. Um, and as Julio mentioned earlier, like, do we need that clause? Like, is that needed when right. we have, you know, if, if it's a exhibits bias against an individual, do we need the egregious act language? So Great. that's good to just double down on to point out. Okay. Rebecca? Uh, yeah, you know, um, Kim, thank you for coming to talk to us about this. Throw my my concerns in with already the, the ones talked about in terms of the egregious as a as you know as an attorney who thinks about all of the words chosen right that is absolutely an, an invitation to invite subjective assessments right that's not transparent that's not objective that allows the decision maker to pass along any you know any of the bias implicit ex, you know biases that they come in Right. Uh, it's it's what we fight on the reasonable person and all that. So, yes, egregious, absolutely concerning to me. And I agree. It's helpful to hear that you've pulled that from other other contexts. But I would be very curious to hear about where your models are coming from, from actually other jurisdictions with with codes, ethic codes for law enforcement in the context of racial discrimination. Uh, another word that jumped out, all the qualifiers in that paragraph, too. The one we haven't talked about, 
it's at the end when you say and. So it's this, as Julio pointed out, all these status-based uh, discriminatory acts. Uh, another status one I saw missing, although I think your catch-all covers it, but um, language proficient, proficiency, right, is, is, is another status base. But it's um, and, and substantially demonstrates that you that the officer cannot perform duties, right? So it's not just you, you do this course of conduct or single egregious act of a status-based discriminatory thing, but it's also an and. And there must be, you know, a substantial, right, substantially demonstrate. So again, what does that mean, substantially? Um, I don't even know what the demonstration would be in terms of the not being able to perform. Again, not being familiar with, with the specific drop down on the Code of Ethics. I don't know where that's coming from. And I think that vagueness invites arbitrary application and, and selective enforcement of, of it, if it's enforced at all, because it can be so vaguely interpreted as to never be enforced. Uh, so that I worry that that's an empty goal that can't actually have any teeth to it. The other concern, I look at page two, and it um, talks about not engaging in criminal conduct. I'm familiar with these broad prohibitions in terms of my client, my probation, and my client who's on, on probation are these standard conditions imposed in almost every probation order. Uh, probationer shall not engage in criminal behavior. We have litigated that term up and down, and the latest word on criminal behavior is anything that has been criminalized in the state of Vermont. I shall not engage in criminal behavior. Is that beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Uh, I think uh, it's it's not that high. It's not that high. It's also a broad definition. So I was curious why this code is a specific and limited def definition criminal conduct. It's not the entirety of our criminal code in the state of Vermont. It's linked to a particular title in that section. I just looked it up and it looks like you're tracking the acts language saying that this code sh must include this prohibited type of criminal conduct. And conduct A looks like a, a finite list of felonies and certain misdemeanors, right? There's also what I thought interesting, a category B list of bad conduct that seems like it should be included in this somewhere, right? Because it's, 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 it's relevant. Category B means you will not engage in sexual harassment involving physical contact or, or misuse. B, misuse of official position for personal or economic gain. Sheila brought that up in a different context, but again, these category B uh, acts seem relevant. Excessive use of force, biased enforcement, use of electronic criminal records database for personal, political, or economic gain, placing a person in a chokehold, failing to intervene and report. I just wondered why the category B conduct that seems really critical to be brought in wasn't brought in, even though I see that it's not required to be brought in under the act. Eitan, may I answer that? Of course, I was just wait, waiting to, yes. No, thank you, Rebecca. Um, I scribbled down as quickly as possible the feedback on the discrimination piece, thank you. Um, the So the category B conduct, um, definition that you see in the statute, that's the definition that with Act 124 is changing. And so the the policies that are highlighted in that list A through uh, A through I, um, those had been the policies, the, the local law enforcement policies and some statewide policies that the legislature had highlighted as like, you know, these are the big ones uh, that Category B needs to capture. And so when we created the Code of Conduct, we we believe we have, but if we haven't, we, we definitely need to point it out. We incorporated that list to make sure that each of those were addressed in the Code of Conduct so that now the Category B definition moving forward after January 1 simply reads, um, that a category B conduct means a willful failure to comply with a state required policy or the law enforcement officer's code of conduct. 
So willful failure to follow, currently what we have is one through 10 would meet that definition of a category B uh, unprofessional conduct complaint. And uh, we could bring a charge, what we call a charge uh, against an officer for that failure to comply. So the, the you're absolutely right, highlighting like that is the behavior uh, in currently in category B that was again tied to local law enforcement policies. And that's where we were seeing uh, inconsistent results depending on how the policies were written. So we took those the policy ideas and put them into the, the code of conduct. All right. Do you have a follow-up question to that, Don? Yeah, let's and let's let that one be the last. So because we have one more thing to go to. Okay. Um so if I heard you write those category Bs, and I see what you're referencing, looking at the adjustments in the 2025. Now there's a category C and others, and and you know, I'm just dropping into this. Mm -hmm. If I'm hearing you right, you're saying the intent is to include all of those prohibited acts or conducts into this current code? Yes, the, those acts that previously would have been picked up by local law enforcement policies as a violation. Yeah. We, that's what we've attempted to do. And if you look at the, the legislative act, um, they also sort of took that list and said, you know, your code of conduct will include, uh, you know, sanctioning this behavior. So we we tried to match that up. Um, but again, like if what we, by sending this out, what we're hoping is that with many eyes looking at this, like if we miss something, uh, you know, with how we worded it or just that, that we capture that because we our intent is not to lose anything on that list. The legislature, uh, you know, highlighted those policies for very good reason, right? Those, because that correlates with a more complicated thing that most of the things on those that list could be actionable in the past. Um, all of those things now will be actionable uh, moving forward. Well, Kim, I hope you've got a bunch that will be helpful. Yes. I, I really appreciate your time. Um, and, and again, um, I'll ask Tiffany to uh, circulate the feedback survey. So if after this conversation and folks want to go back and, and read uh, either the rules that we're drafting or the code of conduct, um, please feel free to submit uh, using that survey. If you don't like surveys and you don't want to look at another survey, feel free to email me uh, directly um, Kim.McManus at Vermont.gov. I'd be happy to, I'm collecting all of the feedback and we'll be bringing it to the subcommittee after the 20th. So remember everyone, whatever feedback you're doing, it needs to be done by the 20th, 10 days from now. Just, you know, I have to be the timekeeper. All right. Thank you very much. Um, for being here and for speaking and putting us on the right path, I guess, to talking about this. Thank you. Jen invited her. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and get back to us if there's more you need. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate okay. everyone. Take care. The last issue item on the agenda is a continuation of the discussion concerning more effective communication between the RDAP and the legislature. And that is going back to the discussion that we've inaugurated about legislation to, um, in fact, work on the impact assessments, the policy impact assessments for bills that go through the legislative process. Um, I there are some problems that we're going to have with this legislation, and I think it would be helpful probably to everybody, including Ledge Council, if we came if we actually thought about and started thinking about 
some things that may be problems in this effort. And I wanted to put that before all of us, that it's really kind of time to do that and to look at this and see where there may be issues. People have spoken at great length about what goes on with those assessments and so on. So there are things to be said, there are things to be put out there. Um, and this is really, as I say, time to do it. One that I wanted to bring up, at least to just sort of show you what I've been thinking about, is who's going to read all of this? It can't be ORE. They don't have enough people to, like, wash the floor. I mean, they. it can't be ORE. It just can't. There's got to be either some extant body or yet another body. I know I say yet another body and everybody gets like a rectal clench of terror. But in any event, um, we somebody's got to be able to do this because this could be a huge amount of reading. Remember that some of the bills that came that we were asked to look at, we couldn't look at because they were like 80 pages long. Um, so I don't have an answer. But back to my thing about us all being at each other's external hard drive, I'm hoping as a group, you may not have answers for this now, but that's a huge one. That is a huge one to me. And it's something that I think we as a group need to help the legislature come up with. And by that, I'm also talking about Representative Lalonde and, of course, Representative Arsena, who wants to sponsor this. Susanna. I just want to add more complications to it. It's not, um, yeah. I mean, I, it, yeah. Um, part of it is, yes, who's going to read all this? The other part of it is every time an amendment gets made to a bill, are we doing a new impact assessment, uh, you know, does it step on the old one? Do we keep the old one? I think another question is not just who is going to read it, but who's going to want to read it? And are these uh, documents that should be made open to the public? Who's, um, you know, is this is this falling under some kind of privilege? Um, you know, are these records that are supposed to be publicly discoverable? Um, I think I think to the question of who's going to read all this, I think it's going to be like it currently is in the sense that if you're following a certain committee, you're going to read the stuff that comes out of that committee and maybe you don't pay attention to any of the other ones. Um, so I think it, 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 if the legislature were to move forward with a with adopting an impact assessment process, it would likely just be the case that people are going to read ones that are related to things they're following. And we're just all going to hope that somebody is catching something. Uh, I know that that's true in a number of other committees, right? We tend to read things that come out of the, the justice committees. Um, we hope that someone else is watching, I don't know, ways and means and flags uh, something, right? And when I say we, I don't mean us because we actually are watching all the committees. But th in theory, um, somebody or, or a working group that is on point for one topic are often not pay paying attention to the other stuff, but somebody is, right? And we, we hope that someone's flagging it. But I do think that it's um, important. And again, I know I keep coming back to this, but the question of who's 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 on point to write these, um, and not for nothing, but some people's analysis is trash. And it's not because they don't want to give good analysis, but it's just because they may not have the data on point or they may not have the, the deep understanding of, of where to look. You don't know what you don't know. So... You know, to some extent, the question of who's going to read it is almost, almost rendered moot because if we're getting bad product, it doesn't matter who's reading it because we're not really uncovering potential disparities um, in a way that's meaningful. So there's, there's, it's a lot. Thank you. Uh, yay. <laughs> Tyler. I'll just, I think I, I love this conversation. That was the very first thing that occurred to me is that question, who's writing this and who's reading this? Um, and how are we going to make sure there's utility to it? And Susanna, you, you, you hit the nail on the head as you do many times. 
But I wonder if part of it is right now we have a situation where for the most part, a bill moves through without it being done at all. Um, that's the process. And there is some utility as an intervention, so to speak, that somebody is forced, depending on how this comes out, to slow down and be thoughtful about impact. Um, whether they organize that in a way that we we could critique or we could challenge or whatever, it's it's forcing the slow down and think this through a little bit. And there is some utility to that. I wonder about, um, and again, I'm not a legislator, so I'm looking at at you, Representative Lalonde, um, and uh, but I, I, I'm I'm wondering if there would be some utility to have it be public facing, so that you can see the evolution of the thinking as the bills coming together, and it it could be one document that is a living document. So as the bill is refined the assessment is adjusted to reflect the diff changing language of the bill. It, it, there's a vulnerability associated with this. I would hate to stymie um, progress on moving a bill forward because you're adding more step and you're adding more. Sometimes things things come out in the wash as you, as you work your way through it. Um, but there is some value to seeing you know, what the thinking, how people think about the equity impact of this as a thing evolves. Um, so I'm just wondering, is is the utility of doing it worthwhile? And if we don't have it be to some degree public, uh, then it's just a, then it could just be a side product, which is hidden and doesn't actually have that utility anymore. My other, God, I just lost it. Never mind. Keep going. Oh no, it's back. Sorry. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> is there a problem with asking the sponsors of a bill to complete the impact assessments? So can I just weigh in on, uh, on just one of those issues and what, just what you said as well, uh, Eitan? Dear God, uh, yes. <laughs> so, so I mean, one of the other issues is that, well, just taking the, the Judiciary Committee, um, we get something like 80 bills on our so-called wall. <clears throat> and I, and as a chair, I know 70 of them. There's no chance we're even going to take them off the wall and look at them. Maybe that's not quite the right number. But that would be, a, I already feel I'm wasting my leg, my legislative council's time on them having to do so many bills. And we keep on trying to figure out how best to limit that on the one hand, but but the legislators got to have, I guess, the opportunity to put those bills out, even if there's no chance they're going to be even taken up. So, so that's just another complication here is that uh, I don't want to have, you know, already there's a lot of wasted time of our legislative council. And I'm not saying this is wasted time whatsoever, uh, uh, particularly for the bills that we are taking up. So that's kind of one point. The other point is that that we did um, ineffectually uh, with the, the SEC um, caucus, um, we, we, we had a list of questions that we wanted uh, to have asked in the different committees uh, as far as questions that are similar to what's in, in the uh, policy impact assessment. But that was never formalized and it was easily overlooked. And, and frankly, that has happened in the Judiciary Committee as well, uh, even though we have the chair of the SEC uh, in, uh, in the committee. Uh, I will tell you, we we do try to look at these issues, but it needs to be formalized better. You know, we, we try to bring in folks and, and we're going to do a better job of bringing in different voices uh, next year. But we certainly would bring in the Office of Racial Equity. We'd bring in defenders. We'd bring in folks. And these are the issues that would be brought up, but still not formalized enough. So so that's I'm not answering any questions here, <laughs> but I, I appreciate the complication. Um, and, and I just I felt like we had to complicate it because it's not as simple as just writing a bill. <laughs> We're gonna, we want this done, and it's like, I, yeah, no, don't do that. It, it almost never is as simple as writing just right. Writing. Um, 
Rebecca. Seems to me RDAP has two direct experiences we can draw from as we sort of think about this project. We have both the data workup, which took how how many hours of our time? I don't I don't know. <laughs> and then we had uh, another example is the second look. And at that other extreme, we didn't get into the details, right? We we stayed at a, at a higher level. Now I appreciate all the concerns, and 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 it's true that the, the challenge and speaking from my experience, often the witness chair in, in both um, judiciary committees and those sorts of stuff, I see how how hard it is from that narrow, limited perspective. I think that there is still a role for us to play and to be useful. I think that it is not our job, our DAP's job, to come up and 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 try to have a goal because I don't think it's realistic to provide draft legislation. I think that it is better to think about, because otherwise it will always keep us at this sort of too big to, to get it started, uh, to get going, right? And I I, I, I wonder if, if how how can we do this without shutting down the legislature or or just yeah just straining already limited resources et cetera et cetera? We are the criminal juvenile justice systems panel. We could propose that these assessments be done in particular categories or bills. Whenever there's a new crime proposed, whenever there is an amendment to a current criminal bill propose whenever there is right so we can see how this gets uh more of a, a somewhere in between perhaps the the suggestions we made with the data bill and the second look right juvenile justice where would we want we have a sense generally categorically speaking we have a sense as a panel over the years where we would want to be asked where we would if we had the opportunity be able to weigh in. We know from the data that we've used and, and looked at where there are known problems. We know about, right, we could be focused even more within criminal crimes of priority within certain things, drug, the drug offenses, right? The ones where we have received presentations with the worst disparities, uh, provide that prioritization. Uh, Suzanne, I appreciate that website you shared around to the group before this meeting um, that seems to have mapped out all the jurisdictions around the country that have either passed similar legislation or have some pending and have hyperlinks to it. Again, I don't think we have the resources on this panel to dive in. Maybe I I, I shouldn't speak, but I'm conveying what I'm feeling <laughs> in terms of diving into all of these different uh, act, uh, past and pending legislations um, to see how they have resolved some of the questions that have come, come up tonight. Um, if it's not an existing body, who is it embedded within the legislative structure of Ledge Council or is it a dedicated commission, right? We have a sentencing commission, we have RDAP, we have a special commission set up of by whom and, and sourced by what. Um, seems to me that we have beginnings of, of being able to find things I certainly don't want us to sign up for drafting this. I know that uh, we have support from legislators and it's wonderful. Um, I think we should think about it at a more higher level in terms of what we can recommend. And okay. Okay. This is not a conversation, and I'm looking at the time too. This is not a conversation that's going to be finished right now, obviously. Um, I just wanted to bring it up so that we could have this discussion that even where Rebecca goes, where she's like, I don't think we need to go to this level. Fine. But we need, I just felt like it needed to be brought up because. In the end, and I'm going to be really selfish on behalf of the panel here, it needs to help us. So I'm kind of interested in what parts of this do we need to help us to do the work that we are statutorily required to do. That's all. 
and whether that means looking at the sponsor and going something about this or you know and letting them work that through i don't know i'm just um again i'm throwing things out and also saying we're not going to finish it but i did want to inaugurate the discussion this evening it being the meeting in september because we all know it's all going to start it's like that hill right you know it's we're like here and it's about to go like that and um that'll be january and so i wanted to beat that to at least let us think about these bigger issues that may impact something that we're trying to do that will help people get on board. Susanna. Um, I'm normally uh, on the same page as, as RDAP on things and, um, and I definitely respect the, um, the, the recommendation here to have it be tailored to the subject matter uh, of this panel, but just speaking from our office's perspective, I'm just speaking as one stakeholder here. Um, we, we would like to, to see this done across the board in all subject matter areas. And it's likely that if a bill like this were introduced that were focused on one subject matter, we were nine and a half times out of 10, we would come in and say, why not do this for everything? So um, again, I can respect and support if, if RDAP did want to put forward a recommendation that's um, subject matter specific, but it's very likely that ORE is going to go in and just be like, do it for everything. So you should at least be on notice um, of, of that, that it may not that I'm announcing that we I would undermine the group's efforts, but I would undermine the group's efforts a little bit <laughs> for a good cause. Thank you. OK, um, public commentary. Oh, go ahead, Martin, and then public Just, commentary. Uh, real quick on this. Um, so so this concept, uh, this bill would likely be in government operations committee as well. And that, that's another thing I just want to uh, flag. Just that it was interesting tonight, the issues that you were dealing with. Uh, one of them, the first one regarding the DCF uh, facility is really human services committee and the corrections and institutions committee. Judiciary committee has very little to do with actually what that facility is. Uh, even though we're really pushing for the raise the age, for instance, uh, and and that facility has some connection with that, not not as much uh, as some may think. But in any event, so and the other uh, and the other issue you were talking about is really government operations, and I apologize that we have those silos, uh, but it's just a matter of uh, perhaps we need to have more uh, outreach uh, to some of these other committees that you deal with the, their issues a lot. Uh, you know, I've <clears throat> I, I kept track of what our DAP was doing, and now we have Angela uh, helping to do that. But you're only catching a small part of of the jurisdiction that we have. So that's one thing. The other is <clears throat> just from the statute uh, for our DAP. Uh, it, it's the more specific thing that you do with respect to the legislature is that biannual report. Uh, but that's not limited. I mean, the way that the statute reads is, is uh, these are the uh, different uh, or responsibilities of RDAP, and it's including a bunch of things. Whenever we say including, that means we can add other things, which we've been trying to do, which is getting your input on other, other stuff. But just so you know, we have the bill request in for the raise the uh, delinquency age. Uh, we're doing some other things uh, that I may have mentioned before, and uh, we're, we're trying, uh, we have a group that we're really working hard to understand what our priorities are going to be and actually have bills that are being drafted in the October, November timeframe that you'd be able to see. Right. But that is just, that's not institutionalized. That just happens to be that Angela and Karen Dolan and Barbara Rachelson and I are doing that work this this month and uh, and last month. Uh, so, and it's also not all the committees. So that's not a way to figure this out. That's not the answer um, <clears throat> because it's just depending on, on the people, not the position so much. 
Uh, but we do, uh, you know, there there will be a bill that uh, we certainly are going to want uh, your input on, and and that is uh, to have all uh, all juvenile cases, including when we get to raise the age when it would be nineteen and under, uh, starting in family court, uh, and that the Big Twelve, as or I guess it's the Big Eleven plus three. Uh, would have an expedited way to to actually be transferred to criminal court. But what we want to avoid is situations, and it's not just what happened in Addison County. Other times, whenever somebody, uh, a juvenile, starts in criminal court and is then transferred to family court, you've already done the damage, and we're trying to figure out something uh, to avoid that. Uh, but there are lots of issues underneath that that will be very complicated. This is probably one of the more complicated bills we're going to have uh, when we do have a draft, I will uh, send it by you. And if you guys do have the time or, or want to uh, comment on it. Um, one final thing, and I apologize. Uh, I'll try, uh, I'm going to try to have you on uh, somebody from RDAP, presumably you, Aton, uh giving an update uh, in front of the Joint Justice Oversight Committee, either in the October or November time frame. Um, so that gives you a chance to talk about the impact assessment and some of the other things that are being worked on. So I just wanted to flag that for you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mark and Christine, do you've got anything you need to put in here that you'd like to put in? Thanks, Aton. I, I just would, I would just say I'm just mostly an apology because I was not on the call for a vast majority. I know of the call and I do apologize for that. And um, in, in fact, uh, the thing is, is my youngest daughter called and, and it, it was an emergency. It was not an emergency or anything like that, but it was my youngest daughter. So there you have it. Um, okay. I think um, the one, and I, I wanted to just appreciate um, Martin Lalonde showing up um, surprisingly without a beard uh, and um, just thanking you for, um, you know what you're doing over there in, in uh, House Judiciary, and thank and thanks for also sitting down with us uh, with me uh, earlier uh, in the summer and in, in midsummer. Uh, so that was great because uh, we got a chance to air a few things out uh, for the um, the panel itself. I also, um, you know, would just uh, um, uh, we, I wanted to share that um, you know one of the things that um, I hope comes out in Joint Judiciary is is just a relook. Uh, at the um, at the enabling statute of the RDAP, um, and I just want to strongly encourage the the uh, the panel to um, to maybe get you know to, to circle around that because I I think you know sometimes you know the, you know as you operate within the parameters of the authority that you're prescribed in the the, um, the guidelines that the enabling statute provide for you that's all you can do, but we do have the ability to 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 get in there and and maybe tweak it up a little bit uh, to to be able to give you um, the ability to lean in a little bit more. And I really want to you know stand with you on that and be supportive of that. Uh, to you know to maybe we can figure out a way to you know get some more teeth uh, and get some get some um, maybe establish some some very, um, you know, defined metrics with some of the tools that we have in, um, and even figure out, you know, how we can create some measurements so we can figure out um, where we're making or if we're making progress as well. I, you know, I, I would be like hugely supportive of that. And I would even try to rally folks to, to bring cool. in testimony to support that. So I just wanted to, to share right. that with you all. And and I I mentioned it to um, to uh, Martin and and I just wanted to just put that before the panel and just for your consideration and maybe what we can do is we can talk about it further and moving forward. Thank you for uh, allowing me to just at least have a, a brief comment here at the end. Uh, have I'm a great sorry day. it was so short, Mark. We I didn't plan as well as I thought I did. Well, thank Thanks, you all. Thanks, This is Christine. Sorry, my yes. camera's on, but thank you for that too. I'm all set. I've just been listening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Then I will say to all of you, uh, new business can wait till new business, which is, you know, like next month. Um, our next month meeting is on the 8th of October.
Um, again, it will be from six to eight. I will not waste our time by asking for the formal adjournment motion and so on and so forth, since I can read all of your faces and say, have a lovely month, and I will talk with you all in October. I will probably be in touch before then, and if you've got anything to send to me, please do it.